Now, the horror genre is one that so often sets its stall out from the get-go as it looks to grab the audience by the seat of their pants. But on the flip side of this, though, there are those horror efforts whose first minute or two have the unwanted result of turning their audience off. So let's take a look at them then. As I'm Jules, this is WhatCulture.com, and these are 10 horror movies that lose you in the first 60 seconds. Number 10. Alien 3 Starting with the biggest movie on this list, one that took home nearly $160 million at the box office upon its 1992 release, Alien 3 had audiences gnawing at their fists thanks to its first few minutes. For all the promise of Alien's closing moments, where we were told that the survivors of that film were heading towards Earth, that all turned out to be utter bullshit. And not just did the ending of Aliens put Ripley, Hicks, Newton, Bishop on a course for Earth, but the early trailers for Alien 3 outright stated via voiceover that the action of this threequel was to take place on mankind's home planet. That Alien 3 didn't feature Earth whatsoever is a major bone of contention among franchise fans to this day, but that third feature's opening minutes are even more frustrating. With audiences emotionally attached to Hicks and Newt, Alien 3 did the unthinkable and killed them off, off screen no less, in the first sequence. Explaining how the escape pod of aliens crash-landed at the Fury 161 foundry, Hicks and Newts were lazily killed in said crash. Android Bishop just about survived that accident, and Ripley obviously made it through the crash in order to lead the narrative of Alien 3. But offing those two other hugely popular characters is arguably the biggest misdemeanor made by Alien 3. Number 9. Microwave Massacre Wayne Berwick's Microwave Massacre centers on a middle-aged construction worker who grows increasingly unhappy with the elaborate food his wife cooks for him. While his work pals turn up with bologna sandwiches for their lunch break, poor old Donald here is left baffled when he unpacks giant crabs and the like. For Donald's wife, May, she's purchased an expensive microwave that she uses to make these dishes that are deemed high class. After numerous arguments, a sozzled-up Don ends up bludgeoning his wife to death one night, then starts to realize that the tastiest food on the planet is actually human flesh. From there, Vernon's character starts to murder people to feed his cravings. Now, while one could ponder why Donald couldn't just make his own lunch if he was that damn unhappy, many modern audiences may not even get to that part of the plot, because the opening sequence of Microwave Massacre is a ridiculously misogynistic one. As the opening credits roll, the camera is zoomed in on the backside of the young lady as she walks down a street. From there, the camera changes to focus on the girl's breasts. Bafflingly, the woman then stops on the other side of the fence next to Donald's construction site, where she she proceeds to stick her bare boobs through a well-placed hole. This bizarre opening does nothing for the plot and has clearly not aged well in the years since Microwave Massacre was released way back way in 1979. Number 8. Silent Night, Deadly Night, Part 2 Yes, yes, Silent Night, Deadly Night Part 2 is famed for spawning the Garbage Day meme that does the rounds every few months on social medias, but the sequel hugely pissed off audiences when it was released in 1987. Now, if you'd not seen Silent Night, Deadly Night, this follow-up may just about work as a standalone feature. For those that did see the original 1984 picture, though, Part 2 was a proper head-scratching affair. And why was the 87 follow-up such a turn-off for the horror hounds? Well, that's because it becomes clear in the opening minute that Silent Night, Deadly Night Part 2 is a retelling of the first film. And not just a case of fresh characters experiencing a similar fate to those in the original movie, but Part 2 literally spends a good 40 minutes or so replaying actual footage of Silent Night, Deadly Night. Once you realise what's happening, Part 2 becomes unwatchable, at least for those 40-ish minutes. And the reason why Silent Night, Deadly Night Part 2 is framed in such a way is because the film features Ricky, the younger brother of the first movie's killer, locked up in a mentalist asylum, he retells what happened to his brother before obviously ending the film by going on his own bloody rampage. Number 7. Three from Hell with Three from Hell, it's only fair to note how much of the film was changed due to the poor health of Sid Haig. Originally, the movie was marketed as Haig's Captain Spaulding, Sherry Moon's Zombie Baby, and Bill Moseley's Otis B. Driftwood somehow surviving their apparent death at the close of The Devil's Rejects, and the three embarking on another journey of chaos and carnage. So, when the opening of Three from Hell saw Spaulding executed by lethal injection for his past crimes, it left audiences cold to realize that this beloved character was not actually going to be involved 
in said journey. Instead, the threequel shoehorned in an entirely random half-brother of Otis named Foxy Coltrane, who joined the surviving two Fireflies on their murderous adventures. By having only a minute or two of Captain Spaulding, Three from Hell immediately lost a lot of viewers who realized that they weren't going to be getting the film that they thought they were going to be getting. As mentioned, so much of it was out of their control, with the actor's ill health restricting his movement by the time that shooting properly got underway. The actor would tragically pass away at the age of 80 on the 21st of September 2019, just five days after Three from Hell was released. Number 6. Hostel Part 2 for those who watched the truly harrowing antics of Eli Roth's Hostel back in 2005, it was impossible not to become invested in Jay Hernandez's Paxton as he overcame the odds to escape the clutches of the nefarious elite hunting club. Having seen his best friend and several others tortured and killed, Paxton closes out Hostel by outwitting the elite crew, hopping on a train out of Slovakia, and also managing to kill the unnamed Dutch businessman who offed his pal Josh. And when it was announced that Hostel Part 2 was on the way for 2007, the confirmation of Hernandez's inclusion in the sequel had many expecting Paxton would again find himself engulfed in an eerie web of the elite hunting club. While that did happen, it was a far shorter battle than anyone would imagine. Rather than spending a solid amount of Hostel Part 2's 94-minute runtime with Paxton trying to evade the club, the film instead opted to have his character hunted down in the opening minutes, where he's promptly decapitated. Hostel Part 2 and its trio of central protagonists, a group of three young American women, did manage to get most audiences back on side but the immediate death of Paxton definitely lost a lot of the audience for a spell. Number 5. The Fly 2 David Cronenberg's The Fly is one of the most memorable horrors of the 1980s, with this 86 adaptation of the short story being particularly famed for its jaw-dropping practical special effects work. By the end of the film, Jeff Goldblum's Seth Brundle has become a deformed fly-human hybrid who was mercifully put out of his misery by his pregnant girlfriend Veronica and a shotgun. When The Fly 2 rolled around three years later, those expecting to see Veronica taking center stage as a mother raising her potentially fly-infused offspring were left rather disappointed. While Gina Davis, much like David Cronenberg and Jeff Goldblum, didn't return for the sequel, the Veronica character did. Unfortunately, the character, as played by Saffron Henderson, was killed in the opening moments as she gave birth to her and Seth's baby boy. And with that move, The Fly 2 pretty much severed all emotional connection to its predecessor, essentially opting to regurgitate the story of the first film just with Eric Stoltz's Martin Brundle replacing his father Seth. But one fun slice of trivia for The Fly 2, though, is that Saffron Henderson also played rocker JJ, who was brutalized with her own own flying V guitar in the cheese-tastic Friday the 13th Part 8, Jason Takes Manhattan in the same year. Number 4. Sharknado 2 – The Second One Sure, the first Sharknado was absolutely daft, consisting of an utterly bonkers premise that was designed to be so bad it's good, but by Sharknado 2, the second one, the bloom was off the rose within the first few minutes of the picture. For the first movie, the sheer gimmickry of the concept was at least an intriguing one, in the sense that audiences were happy to be in on the joke and see where the insane notion of sharks in tornadoes would actually go. It was cute, it was ridiculous, it was on the nose, and it was a fun, silly, one-and-done affair. Alas, the Sharknado franchise was far from over and the series currently sits at a head-scratching six entries. But while the initial 2013 feature was fine for what it was, the first minutes of the second one immediately make you realize the insanity has been turned up to 11, and not in an appealing way. Here, the opening of Sharknado 2 had a character called Finn landing a passenger airplane in the middle of an electrical Sharknado storm, while Tara Reid's April hangs out of the emergency exit in midair with one hand as her other hand shoots sharks out of the sky with a handgun. Oh. Okay then. Number 3. Urban Legends Bloody Mary 1998's Urban Legend was a fun slasher featuring a Parker-adorned killer offing college kids in ways that mirrored classic urban legends. Skipping ahead two years, Urban Legend's final cut followed a similar theme, only with the killer this time wearing a fencing mask rather than a jacket Liam Gallagher would have been proud of. That sequel offering had the post credit stinger that the nurse looking after the now locked in at an asylum Hart Bockner's Professor Solomon, the person behind the murders of the final cut, was in fact the believed dead Brenda Bates, who was the sinister mastermind behind the events of the first film. The final line of Final Cut is Brenda muttering to Solomon how they have a lot in common, hinting at a team-up for the duo in any subsequent movie. For those hoping to see those two insane killers working together in a third picture, well, those hopes were summarily dashed upon a first watch of 2005's Urban Legends Bloody Mary. In the opening minutes of that threequel, a 1969 set flashback shows a young Mary seemingly killed ahead of homecoming. Skipping ahead to the present, the teens of the day are immediately shown trying to reach 
reached the spirit of Bloody Mary, which disappointed audiences in revealing this film to be an unrelated supernatural story rather than a direct continuation of the prior two urban legends offerings. Number 2. I'll Always Know What You Did Last Summer now, granted, I Still Know What You Did Last Summer isn't exactly a classic of the genre, but there was once still a mild appetite for the promised third entry in the Last Summer franchise following that second film's release. While I Know What You Did Last Summer and I Still Know What You Did Last Summer were released in consecutive years, 1997 and 1998 respectively, it took until 2006 for a third movie to finally arrive. Not just that, but this third picture went straight to DVD and featured none of the characters of the prior two offerings. Well, bar a near supernatural take on angry fisherman Ben Willis. It wasn't the wait for I'll Always Know or even the decision to focus on new characters that served as an immediate turn-off for horror hounds. No, what puts you off the film after just a minute or two is just how outright annoying the protagonists of this film are. Upon being introduced to a group of your regular pretty young things at a fairground setting, it instantly hits home that these characters are absolute dickheads. Sure, you could stick around in the hopes that Ben Willis slices and dices these pricks, as he certainly does, but they are so unlikable key figures figures that the knee-jerk reaction is to just turn off the movie rather than witness their demise. And number 1. Halloween Resurrection in all honesty, a handful of Halloween movies are worthy of this list. The realization that Halloween 3 does not feature Michael Myers, the start of Halloween 5 completely erasing Michael's death, seeing Jamie Lloyd recast and killed off in the Curse of Michael Myers opening, but it's actually Halloween Resurrection that gets the nod this time around. While horror fans didn't know it when we were watching Resurrection upon its 2002 theatrical release, star Jamie Lee Curtis had only agreed to appear in the movie if Laurie Strode was killed off in the opening moments, and thus that is exactly what happened. For long-standing fans of the series, they were expecting one more prolonged game of cat and mouse between Laurie and the ominous shape. Sure, even if Michael finally did get the better of his rival in this offering, that at least wouldn't be until some dramatic final battle, right? Nope. The death of Laurie in Resurrection's first sequence was admittedly at the time one of the greatest shocks of the genre, but that demise also immediately soured this eighth Halloween picture to many fans. And that's before we even get to the closing moments sequence of Buster Rhymes using his kung fu skills to beat the piss out of Michael. That was also a thing. And there we go, my friends. Those were 10 horror movies that lose you in the first 60 seconds. I hope that you enjoyed that, and please let me know what you thought about it down in the comments section below. As always, I've been Jules, so you can go follow me over on Instagram, where it's at RetroJ, but the O is a zero, and I hope to see you over there. But before I go, I just want to say one thing. Even though we talked about films that lost you in the first 60 seconds, I hope that you're here in the closing moments of this video, just so you can get a dose of positivity for yourself, my friend. Remember, above all else, that you are a massive legend. You deserve love, happiness, and success, and don't let anything or anyone else tell you otherwise, all right? I want to go out there and smash it today. I believe in you. As always, I've been Jules. You have been awesome. Never forget that, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye.